I want to start with um, a video to get you into the flavor of the place where I worked. So I won't be talking for a few minutes. You'll be listening to music. of the place where I worked. Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University wishes you, Tatumadiba, 
a happy 94th birthday. May your legend continue to live in our hearts today and tomorrow. So that's, um, that's the VC, the Vice Chancellor of the University. Those are students. And the, I, what I love about it is that it's all of these students from all races singing together. And it's quite a beautiful song. And it's just before Mandela died that, that this was made about a year before. But that spirit infuses the place. However, it's complicated. <laughs> so this is part of what I want to talk about today. Um, Whoops. So I was a Fulbright Scholar, as Beth said, in um, South Africa in the year 2011. The academic year runs from January till December. And I was hired to um, work in Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University um, to do, i got a picture of it here, um, to well, I was hired to teach two classes, and I got there, and they said, no, no, you can't teach those classes. We're going to have you do something else, which <laughs> I think is very typical of the Fulbright experience. Um, and what they wanted me to do was to recurricularize the teacher education curriculum and to um, institute the beginnings of a humanizing pedagogy within the faculty of education. So big job and impossible to do in a year, but we got it started. And I'm happy to say now three years later, they are deep into it and still doing fabulous work. So that's the good news. Um, so I am a Mac person, so I have to figure this out. All right. Here we go. So I want to start by talking about the context that I landed in, because nothing that I did happened because of me. It was um, fully due to the context that, that I started in. And that starts with the state of schools within South Africa. Um, you have some fabulous schools, um, the white schools, the, what were once white and still are largely white are fabulous. The Model C schools, so-called, also quite good, integrated. But then there's about 90% of the country that d has no access to those schools, um, lives in situations like this, like this township school that, that um, I visited, where, in fact, no teachers were there at all. The rooms were empty, and the classrooms had dirt floors, and there were no books, and Students had uniforms, but they were um, uh, old and tattered, and food was sparse. Um, so there's that larger national context. And then within the university, it was um, declared by, by Derek Schwartz that by the year 2020, the teaching and learning environment at NMMU will be characterized by students and staff being challenged to strive for excellence and success through an emphasis on a humanizing pedagogy. And further, developing an understanding of a humanizing pedagogy and strategies to give effect to this approach. So it was written into the vision and mission of the university. If I'd just come in as little old me with a humanizing pedagogy, it, it wouldn't have been the same experience. Um, a second element in that fertile context that I stepped into was that the dean, uh, Denise Zinn, had started a revisioning process in 2009. And that involved five two-day retreats with an outside facilitator to um, basically have faculty talk to each other about their past. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission had gone through a few years of this on a large scale. Um, but so much work is, is left undone. I mean, that was, a, in many people's minds, I think, a token um, effort. And so a lot of the conversations that we had in this revisioning process focused around race and experiences of um, race before apartheid, I mean, before the end of apartheid and since. The other factor was that there had been in South Africa multiple separate institutions of higher education. And after um, 
2005, a lot of those institutions were forced to merge. And that meant mer merging not just of races, but of um, classes of university um, employees. So you had researchers who were used to being at a research university having to work with people from the Technicon who were used to doing teacher training. And so there was all kinds of tensions around status um, at work as well. So this wonderful facilitator, Ilsa, took us through a number of different things. Um, the first thing that, that happened, and I said there were five retreats, was that each, sorry, each retreat happened within a place. And the container that, that served as a sort of container for those retreats. So, for example, we went to Mission Vale, which is an extension of NMMU, but it's smack dab in the middle of a township. And it was a place that now has the... Um, early childhood teacher education program in it. But at the time, people were asking for hardship pay to go out there uh, or saying it was too far to go. Um, you know, meanwhile, students from Mission Vale were, were trucking in on public transportation and having to spend time and money to get there. So, you know, the, the, one of those mind shifts that had to go on. Um, another spot was the cricket club at the university, which used to be an all-white institution. So I think that's where they had their first retreat. Um, and then three, whoops, three other locations. Um, the one that I stepped into was at something called the Red Location Museum, which was in a township in Port Elizabeth, where, I, where the university is located. And... Um, Port Elizabeth, like most cities in South Africa, ha was subject to, th to the Group Areas Act where large groups of people were moved out of their homes, had their homes sometimes bulldozed, the land taken back, were sent out to the, the um, outer areas of the city where there was no public tra transportation, no electricity, um, and businesses were taken away and so forth. So that location was, was, was fraught with those memories as well. South End Museum as well was in that part of PE that had been moved, where people had been moved out of, including families of people that were on the faculty where I worked. And then the plantation was, <laughs> just what it sounds like, it was an all-white country club. Um, no longer, but was at the time. So those containers really um, added energy and tension to the work that was done in those retreats. Another thing that we did was to read a book called Knowledge in the Blood. I don't know if you're familiar with Jonathan Jansen. He was a student at Stanford and is now VC at University of the Free States. And he's written about the experience of his white students. And um, the, uh, even though they, they've been born after the end of apartheid, they still carry with them in their blood the memories of all of um, the years of being privileged without an awareness of what that privilege was about. And likewise, um, black written to include all non-white um, people have the same kind of knowledge in their blood. So we, we read chapter by chapter, we read that book, and, and over the th uh, two years that she um, ran those retreats, we dealt with different chapters from the book. So that gave us sort of intellectual context to what we were doing. Um, we also went through group building, trust building sorts of exercises like Courageous Conversations, which is, you can find online, it's a, it's a standardized sort of group process about talking about race um, together. And um, one of the goals of, of the series of retreats was to develop together a vision and a mission for the Faculty of Education. And that was not, I mean, at my institution, we're told you have to have a vision and a mission, and so a committee forms to write the vision and the mission, and then you slap it on, and then nobody ever reads it after that. Um, but this was from the ground up. It was a really organic process engaged in by the whole faculty um, and some students. And finally, at the fifth retreat, we hammered out this vision, which continues to be a tapstone for them, uh, to be a dynamic community of teachers, leaders, and scholars in education committed to creating a vibrant, socially just, and democratic society. And we wrangled over those words. Like, do we want to use democratic? Because democracy's lost its meaning after 
you know, 14 years since, or 17 years since the end of apartheid, for example. Do we want it to be a, a, a just society or a socially just society? And what does just mean? And so, you know, there were deep, really sort of wrangling conversations. And then out of the vision came the, the mission, and that was we are committed to cultivating passionate, engaged, knowledgeable, effective, and compassionate teachers, researchers, and leaders who are critical thinkers and agents of hope, change, and social justice. Through practicing humanizing pedagogies, and I capitalize that only because that's what I worked on, establishing collaborative partnerships with relevant stakeholders, particularly students, schools, communities, alumni, and governments, um, using future-oriented technologies creatively and bringing the classroom into the world and the world into the classroom. So I think I, with my class I do close readings and I think if you do a close reading of these statements you'll see that there's a lot in this, in bo both of these, both the mission and the vision. Um, the other part of the context was a mandate uh, nationally to re-curricularize the teacher education program. So um, there was a, a timeline, a deadline. We had to get certain things done by a certain time, and that, I think, always helps to move things along. And finally, the leadership. Um, Derek Schwartz, who looks much meaner in that picture than he actually is, and, and then my colleague, Denise Sen, who is the dean of the Faculty of Education. And they both... Um, were very active in the struggle against apartheid. Uh, Derek was, um, and Denise, were shot at. Uh, Derek was close to a group of people who were bombed and killed. He fled the country and got his doctorate in philosophy in London. Um, Denise as well. Um, I met her at Harvard, actually. Um, and so they have also a deeply seated commitment to the work around a humanizing pedagogy. And in fact, had worked together at the University of Fort Hare, not far from Port Elizabeth, and had instituted a humanizing pedagogy there. So all of that went into making this a, a very fertile place to do the, the work I came to do. So um, phase one, what is a humanizing pedagogy and what does it look and feel like? So there. You know, humanizing pedagogy is not my term. It, it comes out of Freire's work, um, and he's defined it. And a lot of people um, uh, involved in critical pedagogy have written about it. My experience with a lot of um, the theorists is that they're just theorists, and there's not a lot out there around the lived experience of a humanizing pedagogy. Freire certainly has talked about definite things he does in problem solving. Um, a problem-based uh, teaching and learning. But a lot of the rest of these people, it, it's very broad. And when, when you get down to, okay, so what does it look like in practice? What does it feel like? There's not a lot out there. So we really wanted to know what does it look and feel like? How is a humanizing pedagogy embodied in terms of the, the learner? What is the experience of um, a humanizing pedagogy for them? So we collected stories um, and used a process called recollections, which is a phenomenological process um, developed by Pat Carini, Patricia Carini, uh, and her colleagues. Um, and a lot of her work comes out of reading of Dewey and Merleau-Ponty. Um, and she writes, I rely on the animating power of story to connect your story with mine and both of ours to larger public stories, stories of the era, stories of the race, stories of loss and sorrow, stories of hope and fulfillment, stories of human degradation and destructiveness, stories of human strength in the overcoming of stunning blows of fate, in some stories of how humanness happens in the making, unmaking, and remaking of it. So we gave people prompts. Um, and the first prompt was to remember a time of humanizing pedagogy. And we asked them to think of a time when you as a learner felt supported, expanded, and made more fully yourself. A time when you drew upon your capacities and stretched them in ways that took you to a new place where you felt more powerful and capable as a result. This can be a learning experience that happened either in or out of school. 
your recollection may or may not have a teacher or other learners in it. The most powerful recollections are those that are full of details. Rather than telling a general kind of learning story, for example, my grandmother taught me to cook, tell about a particular time when she taught you to cook a particular dish with note taken of the details of that experience, the setting, the utensils, the smells, the colors, the feel of the tools and ingredients in your hands, the emotions evoked, and the steps taken. And similarly, after we'd gone through the humanizing stories, we asked for dehumanizing stories. And one of the reasons we did that was, as, as Freire writes, concern for humanization leads at once to the recognition of dehumanization, not only as an ontological possibility, but as a historical reality. So we felt it was important to have both. And in fact, as we gathered these stories, people said, but you have to have us tell stories of healing. Because, that, I mean, it wasn't enough for them to stop at the dehumanizing. And they, they wanted to tell the story of moving forward. So healing and forgiveness became another sort of um, rubric that we asked people to speak from at the prompting of, of the people we talked to. So a similar prompt. Uh, think of a time when you as a learner felt unsupported, diminished, made small, or invisible. A learning experience that caused you to question or doubt who you are, where you were made to feel inadequate or stupid as a result. As with the account of learning described above, this can be the humanizing. This can be a learning experience that happened either in or out of school. Your re recollection may or may not have a teacher or other learners in it. And in fact, the stories that we got from people usually contain both humanizing and dehumanizing memories, and often healing memories in it. So that it, while we asked for different stories, we in fact got all those stories sort of all bundled together. And there were several places where this happened. Um, I ran a humanizing pedagogy student research group with uh, three NMU fourth year students who were already in the schools teaching. And they interviewed uh, about seven students apiece. And they had the students um, draw pictures of experiences of humanizing and dehumanizing. So this picture says, Oh, some stars, oh, so the stars and planets, sorry, the stars are planets and moons. Not exactly correct, but, but the point is, he, you know, he's got this giant smile, he, his eyes are wide open, he's got the light bulb over his head, he feels this power at coming to understand something. And then the dehumanizing story of, is of a teacher hitting a student on the head with a ruler, there's also a hammer <laughs> on the table. Um, the students are, are lined up and you don't see their faces. You just see the, either the backs of their heads or sort of featureless profiles. Um, so the, the pictures that they, they gave us were quite um, revealing. Uh, we also um, gathered stories from an ongoing group which we called the Humanizing Pedagogy Hub. And this was a cross-university um, so uh, across schools and departments, um, uh, it was diverse in terms of race. It, we tried to have four students. We could only get one to come, unfortunately. Um, and we met once every two weeks um, with this structure. Um, the first stage was, was collecting recollections of humanizing. And what we did, and I'll show you the form of it later, is we collected, we harvested these themes from the stories. So, so the members of the group would tell their stories. I would listen and do a quick sort of qualitative coding of what I'd heard, say back to the group what I'd heard. They would add to it. Then I would take note of that, go home, and try to organize the themes that I heard and bring it back to them the next time. Um, the second stage was, was consolidating those, those themes that, that we had developed and doing some outside reading, um, including, my class will recognize this, the, uh, using a framework called I, That, and It that comes from David Hawkins' work, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, and beginning to name some of the things that, that we saw in terms of that framework. The third st stage was recollection of dehumanizing, and we went through the same sort of harvesting of themes. And we also engaged in, in homework, whereby um, the members of the hub would 
try to be aware in their teaching when they saw themselves engaging in a humanizing act of teaching or maybe a dehumanizing one. And they would come back to the following meeting and report on those experiences. And one of the things we learned from that work was that all of those stories um, that they had heard, that they told and heard, seemed to accumulate weight and, and sink into them in some way. And they carried those awarenesses with them to the extent that, that they tell stories of being about to say something or do something and almost having those stories stop them in the moment and recalibrate um, what it was that they were doing. So there was an effect just um, in pra on practice as a result of, of sharing those stories. Um, and then the fourth stage was planning for um, sustainability, which as I said, I happy to report there has been. Um, we also spoke to the law faculty and gathered stories from them, from the University Teaching and Learning Committee, so that you know, as they go on with their, um, you know, I think you probably have an office for excellence in teaching and learning at, at UBC, I know we do at Albany, that they could incorporate the idea of a humanizing pedagogy into their work. And I worked with tutors from all over um, uh, the Eastern Cape, which is the province that I was in, the poorest province in South Africa. And tutors were in what were called the rural areas. They often had um, completed 10th grade or sometimes high school, had not gone on to university, but were the only people in the villages and townships where they lived who were qualified to teach at all. So the university would bring them in twice a year to do uh, teacher training with them. And they would also teach teachers in their sites. So um, I talked to about 250 different tu uh, tutors and gathered stories from them. Um, and that, that was an amazing experience. They were so excited about telling their stories that I really couldn't. I'd say, we'll take five. And, and, and I'd have five people come up and they go, oh, 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 more, more. So they'd, they'd come up. And, and at the end of the storytelling, which went on over time, um, there was singing, and, which, which is you know, customary. But, but the whole feel of it was um, a message that these stories really needed to be told. Not just once, but, but over and over again. Um, as I mentioned, the curriculum reform effort was in place. And um, in my work with them, I also had them tell stories of their learning um, and as a way of you know, trying to infuse this notion of humanizing pedagogy into their work with curriculum reform. And then finally, it was um, <laughs> the administrative assistants within the Faculty of Education were so taken with the idea that they asked, can we do this? Can we tell our stories too? So we had a full day retreat um, with them and they, they, you know, they said, we're the front lines with students. We need to be um, informed and, and aware of what it is that we're doing as well. So, so we did it with them, it was great. Um, okay, so I want to play you an example of the kind of story that we heard. This is from a woman named Toko who um, is African, South African, uh, and this is her story. Thank you. I grew up in Paris, as I have said, with my granny. And uh, my parents were here working and had no time for to look after us. And um, my granny was very poor. Okay. I was at a village school and uh, every June, starting at 6, which is now grade 7, had to, children had to pay 50 cents for examination in November. So <clears throat> that was 5 shillings according to my granny. And um, I had to pay this 5 shillings in order to pay to, to write exams in November. And my granny did not have it. I went to school that day depressed because I knew it was the last day for this 50 cents. We call it 50 cents today. Mm -hmm. And um, teachers were not in classes. They were all in one room. 
where they were compiling the alphabetical list that was to go to the inspectors of students that were going to write the essay. And uh, all the children in class were excited because they were going to write the exams in, in November. And they were talking about their future, what they were going to learn at secondary school and all those things. Then I left the class because I was depressed. I went to a corner in the schoolyard. There was a big tree. I lined under this tree and I ended up sleeping because I was depressed and I was afraid of a future without education. And um, but in my sleep, I was shocked by the children running to me, my classmates, shouting, "Sinful man, sinful man!" Which means we've got her. And they dragged me to the teacher. The teacher had arrived um, in class and was asking where I was, and then they found me. And they, they, and I had the teacher because he could see that I was very depressed. He made me sit down and tell him my story. And I told him that uh, the reason why I went there is because I was depressed. I was not going to write. And he listened and listened and took me out of the class and um, to a big room where late teachers were compiling this alphabetical list. When he entered with me, they said, don't tell us that Degeda is going to be in this list too. My surname was, is Degeda. And, and it starts with D. And they were about, they were doing J's and H's. And they did not want to start the list and, and from the beginning. And one of the lady teachers came to me and clapped me and I fell dizzy, you know, and, and, and then the teacher paid my 50 cents and he told me to go back to class. I went to class and I was so depressed and disappointed and embarrassed and but I told myself that I am going to learn. The teacher has given me an opportunity and I grabbed it with both hands. And at secondary, he followed me and, and checked my work all the time. And I did not want to disappoint him. And um, to me, humanizing pedagogy is one in which academics are aware and address the social economic backgrounds of the students in class. And uh, if it was not for that teacher, I wouldn't be here now. And that is why every time in my classrooms, I always make sure that I'm aware of what the students bring to class, of their backgrounds and everything they bring to class, so that I could address it when teaching. Thank you, sir. Thank you. OK. So within that, excuse me. Within that story of Tokos, there, there were several themes that just at first glance that are embedded. Um, poverty, lack of access to resources, this tension of despair and hope, of depression and resilience, the power of being seen, relationship and mutual vulnerability, as well as an awareness of teaching as a political act. So as I said, um, we took those themes, and this, I, you don't have to be able to read this, but this is a picture of the map um, at the beginning of uh, the work that we did that I drew up. So there are themes, uh, I don't know if I can get that any closer. Yeah. So themes like Ubuntu, which is the African term for um, uh, I am who I am because you are who you are. We're, we're in relationship. I am I because you are you. And so relationship, community, um, and Ubuntu, respect and genuine interest, creation of a hospitali hospitable environment, a clean and intellectual space, um, the outdoors, resources, and these are all connected to specific stories in the parentheses that come after it. So as I said, we would work with these maps from week to week and revise them as we went. So, what do the stories 
tell us. Um, what came out of the work that we did um, was a list of nine uh, statements, what we came to call statements of awareness. We started calling them principles, but that felt too fixed um, and too sort of dictatorial. You have to follow these rules. And we didn't want them to be slapped onto the front of the handbooks that the students got and then quizzed. You know, what is principle number six? Um, <laughs> Uh, we, want that it, we want them to be constantly evolving, to be engaged in by students of teacher education and to, be, and to continue to evolve. So I'm going to read them because I think they're, they're really great. Um, the first one was students' humanity, its existence and expansion is at the heart of a humanizing pedagogy. All students and all teachers are human beings and equal in their humanity. We are in the process of becoming. The purposes of education are to extend this humanity through opportunities for creativity, imagination, and interaction with others and the world. Teaching is a political act. Classroom and school environments, as well as political and social contexts, are always in play. They impact learning and can restrict or enlarge learning. Teaching, students and, uh, students and teachers and schools, also has the power to impact these contexts. Ultimately, a humanizing pedagogy reaches towards a just and democratic society. It therefore requires interaction among learners and between learners and the world. Teaching requires listening closely, being present, communicating, and paying attention. Teaching requires work on oneself. Awareness of prejudices and limiting assumptions about what is possible frees up space for learners to be fully present, which frees the teacher as well. Teaching requires the teacher to be fully present, to attend, and to communicate openly, which is easier when there is room for the teacher's real self. Yep. Ubuntu, connectedness, relationship, and community. Feeling a part of something larger than oneself is central to the purposes of education. Teaching and learning happen in relationship with oneself, with others, and with the world. Learning extends beyond the self to include the other and the natural world where there is mutual vulnerability and mutual change. Education for the sake not only of the individual but the community, nation, and world. We are all connected to each other and to the planet. Learning requires hope for a future that includes oneself. Number five, learning requires teachers and learners to have a, res a respect for and genuine interest in and curiosity about themselves as learners and the act of learning. A learner is not n knowable except through what they do and create that comes from who they are. Teaching is a process of discovery about learners and their learning. Without genuine interest in who students might be and respect for them as human beings, doors to discovery will be closed. Six, learners need to be recognized, appreciated, acknowledged, and seen. As human beings, all learners and teachers benefit from appreciation of who they are and the capacities they possess. They're, these must be seen in order to be appreciated and acknowledged. Seven, space and a safe space for student voice, student self, the teacher's genuine voice, the teacher's self must be created. Without a safe space, the self, like a snail, pulls back into its shell. Without the presence of the student self, little learning will happen. Without the presence of the teacher's self, relationship will not flourish. Fear will dominate teaching and joy will be absent. Eight, teaching and learning are courageous acts of discovery. They require one to inquire into, move into what feels like someone else's nonsense, relinquishing one's own sense and temporarily suspending one's own identity. They require the courage to own one's questions, create one's own knowledge, and connect that knowledge to other knowledge. They require self-expression and vulnerability. They require interaction with others and with the world outside the classroom. And finally, teaching and learning require health, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and freedom from fear. Basic human needs must be met before learning can flourish. So what's new here, and why should people care? Um, as I said, the statements of awareness, um, we came to slowly through telling those stories and through crafting those themes into... Um, into the statements of awareness. And, you know, one of the things that, that was really evident is that 
people have to go through that process themselves. It's I, I, we can't just leave it to the humanizing pedagogy hub or leave it to this group of tutors. It has to happen each time before those statements will be embraced. So uh, some tentative insights that we had. Um, one was the imperative of, of relationship. Oh, and did I... What did I do with that I, that, it? Mm, it's gone. Um... Uh, the imperative of a relationship, the, the permission to incorporate the, the relational, and the I, thou, it is um, a triangular, <laughs> sorry, where I is the teacher, thou is the student, it is the content, and there is a relationship in all directions, plus other relationships that go, on, that go on. The it, although it may be called math or history or something else, actually belongs to the world. That the it is the world. It's just um, sort of cordoned off for the purposes of efficiency. Um, but it belongs to the world. Content belongs to the world. And if there's direct interaction between the thou and the it, that's a way of, of um, humanizing the learning experience because the thou in engaging reveals who they are and, and enlarges who they are. And a lot of the teaching that was going on in South Africa, and I think everywhere, goes this way, goes through the eye rather than um, with direct interaction with the world. So, um, so the I-thou is, is the teacher-student relationship and how important that is. But one of the, the misconceptions of a humanizing pedagogy was that that was all there was. It was all about the relationship between the teacher and the students. And in fact, that's just part of what it is. The other part was this need to focus on the thou, it. This is, this is about learning. It's not just about relationships. It's about stuff that we need kids to be learning. Um, a second insight was the invisible forces of contact context and there's a lot of the themes that I had talked about access knowledge poverty resources language institutional structures social structures status all these things that um, were in place and and so restricted or so determined those dehumanizing experiences that people had people in their stories weren't naming them necessarily they were embedded in the stories, but they weren't named. And when we started to name them in our process of, of um, uh, you know, uh, harvesting the themes, there was this recognition, oh, yeah, 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 that, that's really important. I need to name that. And there's that great quote from Freire where he writes, human existence cannot be silent, nor can it be nourished by false words, only by true words with which men and women transform the world. To exist humanly is to name the world, to change it. Once named, the world in its turn reappears to the namers as a problem and requires of them a naming, a new naming. Human beings are not built in silence, but in word, in work, in action, reflection. So the naming of those contextual forces um, animated the people who were telling the stories. Um, and then there was this catharsis of telling, giving voice to one's experience, and as I said, naming. I worked in the refugee camps in Southeast Asia back in um, the early 80s and listened to lots of stories of Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees coming out um, by boat and by land, and, and they would tell us their stories over and over and over again, the same stories. And one of the things I learned was those stories need to be told until they don't need to be told anymore. Um, so the valuing of teachers and students' stories as a starting place for inquiry and liberation. The story is powerful. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but I am so glad that that's where we began. Um, the recognition of resilience, creativity, and oppositional power that were embedded in those stories. Um, you know, so many stories of uh, being beaten in school, and yet, you know, Re persisting, persistence, and you know what's called grit. Um, it's so beyond grit, uh, and and their success in in moving beyond that dehumanizing experience. 
um, and then restoring one's right to belong to the future that they are uh, not just belonging to but creating. Um, uh, another thing was be trusting what you know. And this we saw, um, seeing the known and the new. What I mean by that is that um, being told that the I-thou relationship was critical to teaching was t taking something that a lot of, um, particularly the tutors knew through their experiences in, with Ubuntu and Namaste um, and church, um, where relationship was obvious and a big part of um, their experience of those institutions saying that also belongs in school. So the, the permission to take that kind of knowing, that way of being, from those contexts of Ubuntu, of Ubuntu Namaste and Church into the school context um, was a bit of a revelation for them. Um, and that that sort of recognition, oh, I have, I have this already in me, um, was able to lead to the development of agency and voice and more trust in themselves. Um, and I've talked about this collective weight of story and the power of story for awareness, that there's awareness that's built in the telling, um, awareness that's built in the hearing of, of other stories and you know, holding on to those in memory, and then um, incorporating those um, awarenesses into one's self which then directs action in the future. So the next steps, and as I said, the, um, this was three years ago that we did this work. Um, so forming communities of inquiry across the, the faculty, that has continued. The Humanizing Pedagogy Hub continues. Um, there have been meetings with school teachers and principals, but not nearly enough. There's an organization called the um, Center for the Community School, which exists um, and has begun to do some of this work, but there's a lot more work to, to go. Um, the rewriting of the teacher education curriculum is nearly done. It's in its last phases. It's due in December. So it should be fully incorporated. Um, and I may be going back in, in the fall, um, and I'll have a chance to see what that actually looks like. And then the training of NMMU faculty and school personnel in teaching methods. So how do these statements of awareness transform themselves into what we actually do in teacher education programs? What's that going to look like you know, in terms of activities? So some important complicating factors um, include my role as white and American and privileged and absolutely new to the South African context where I really had to assume a stance of not knowing and it's sort of constantly being hit upside the head with, with awarenesses, right? Like, oh, how could I be so stupid? But, you know, it, that's how it goes. Um, I did have a close relationship to the dean, and she was a fabulous teacher for me in, in helping to explain things. But that close relationship um, put me in a position of, with the rest of the faculty, as somebody who had the ear of the dean and therefore what was safe or not safe to tell me. Um, I was a woman in, in a, I say, doubly patriarchal context. The, um, the Dutch Reformed Church is a hugely powerful institution in South Africa, and as a white blonde woman, it was often assumed that I was uh, an Afrikaner um, and was treated as such. Um, and then the black community is also quite patriarchal. So in terms of um, the status of women, South Africa is uh, significantly behind the, much of the Western world. Um, so my authority may have been questioned because I was a woman. Uh, and also as facilitator of, of these groups of storytelling, um, all the stories were told in, in English. And for a lot of people, that was their second or third language. So, you know, who knows what was lost in translation in those stories. If those stories could be told in, in their own first language, we may have had a different set of stories. Um, another limitation was in the prompts, uh, that those prompts assumed a preliminary definition of what a humanizing pedagogy looked like. So there was um, a bit of circumscribing um, the data that we got. Uh, and then the power dynamics, that um, the imperative for the, the humanizing pedagogy did come from the top down. 
Um, even though generating those themes came from the bottom up, it was still something that the university was imposing on the rest of the university. And that's it. Thank you very much.